Welcome, folks. Thank you all. Uh, so hopefully, we can move through this quickly and respect your time and, and get you all up uh, as needed. So, we've got a call to order. It looks like we've got a quorum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do we know if Keith or Himera is coming? I do not believe that Keith will be here. I cannot recall if Himera is actually just traveling. Okay. Yeah. She went to the Any adjustments to the agenda? We have several. So, we will be adding a field trip presentation from Mr. Bartlett. Um, we will um, and the paper for the field trip. And yes, yes, we have a handout for the field trip. Um, we will uh, begin the meeting this evening with our the following presentations uh, from Mr. Beck uh, regarding Hopkins Academy. He'll review the strategy document and some of the Hopkins data. After uh, his presentation, because Mr. Beck is going to Pro Marito, which starts shortly, um, then we'll go through our field trip presentations. As I said, we've added one. Uh, then we will go back to the business manager reports. Chris is not here this evening, so I will report on, uh, give all the financial reports. And there will be no uh, town financial management team update, but I will be discussing uh, asbestos, our most recent asbestos walkthrough. Uh, of all of our uh, okay. uh, Hopkins, actually, and the greenhouse, and I will be discussing water testing. Excellent. Okay. All right, so should we move on first? The first thing is Hopkins, you said? Hopkins yes. Assessment? Yes. Mr. Beck? Sure. Um, first thing I wanted to be able to share was, um, I know uh, Dr. Wickman had come last month. Um, I was obviously stuck dealing with the uh, accreditation visit, which occurred at the same time, and so Annie was kind enough to put the Hopkins strategy document for the school and the school improvement plan on, on this month's agenda. And really, uh, two key things to focus on. First of all, <clears throat> that um, this year the faculty uh, we need to go through a process of committing to a, a unified vision through taking our mission and turning it into a, a statement of core values and beliefs about student learning rather than having a mission statement and, and articulating that in a way that takes into consideration uh, feedback from every stakeholder group in a way that we can get access um, to thoughtful information because ultimately the commitment of the core values and beliefs um, needs to be undertaken by the entire faculty. And so rather than having the faculty just simply vote on something, um, we, want, we wanted to begin um, by getting information and, and feedback from students on what it is that they value, what, it, what do they find to be the purpose of education. And so we're going to begin with a meeting in December um, to gather some information. I'm going to do a presentation for the entire student body together. And then similar to what we have, what has been piloted by some other groups, the students will then go back uh, and collaborate for a brief period of time in their homerooms um, with some guidance from their, uh, their teachers and um, pass in a document that allows them to individually be able to articulate what they find to be most valuable uh, about education, what they would like, uh, their aspirations for the school, um, what they would like to see teachers make a commitment to, what they value most about the things that they like about the school. Um, and then we'll take that information um, to the faculty and uh, in through the month of January, I'm sorry, student council will pull that together in through the month of January. Uh, faculty will begin to combine that with research on um, academic expectations. Last year we developed two civic and social expectations that we've made a commitment to and we're just about, uh, we'll, we'll be done in fairly short order with having measurement tools um, for those expectations that will allow us to be able to report out on um, both individual student achievement of those expectations as well as school-wide achievement of those expectations. And we'll need to do the same thing with our academic expectations. 
in between the athletic seasons, the second stakeholder group that will gather information from will be um, <coughs> the parents um, using a, a model that we've put in place for the last couple of years and getting disseminating the information uh, much more quickly and trying to cultivate parent participation and support in uh, forums that are hosted by students. So parents have an opportunity to speak directly with students. Students will then provide that information to the faculty. And then over the course, and we're looking at doing that in March because it's between athletic seasons and uh, there's a little bit of downtime in between where people will typically have a little bit more of an opportunity with uh, less likelihood of, of uh, conflict to be able to come and engage in those discussions. Pull all that together with the research that the faculty has done so that by the time we get to you know, uh, the start of the 2018-2019 school year, that we've made a commitment to a set of guiding core values and beliefs. And we've uh, come up with a collaborative set of, a collaborative definition of what uh, rigor means, um, as well as a set of uh, clearly defined and measurable academic expectations that the entire school can, can make a commitment to. Add those to our handbooks, add those to all of our documents, and really to use those as uh, guiding principles uh, as the, I know the district is, is going to be redoing its own three-year strategy document and going through a similar process, and so hopefully some of that information can make a contribution to the district process as well. But to guide everything from financial decisions to curricular decisions to the way we uh, incorporate the code of conduct and, and look at taking disciplinary action with students, um, conversations even that we have with parents to really be able to fall back on that set of uh, guiding principles. Um, the second item that I wanted to focus on, uh, because the, these are two things that really transcend uh, a couple of different categories with um, the development of core values, beliefs, and learning expectations, as well as um, in, under instructional leadership, uh, also falls under uh, family and community engagement. <clears throat> but also under instructional leadership, um, over the course of last year, uh, the middle school math teachers have developed a set of interim uh, math assessments that um, are common uh, across grade level. So regardless of whether students are in pre-algebra or math seven, um, and it's a, a set of um, a set of assessments that are administered at various points during the school year. We've we've termed them to be quarterlies, so that they become cumulative over time, and uh, it allows us to be able to look at. Uh, along with the data that we're able to gather from the computer-based IXL um, structure, that uh, the middle school math teachers have aligned the IXL um, assessment system with our curriculum and with our own assessments, so that they're able to do that topic by topic um, rather than having to search around. So they know exactly what it is that they're looking at, exactly what it is that students are working on at the time. Um, but the interim assessments allow us to take a look at growth of students and their skill development and uh, their, their uh, accumulated content knowledge over time um, rather than looking at what we typically look at, which is just a unit exam, which only measures a student's performance on a particular topic at a particular point in time. It doesn't tell us anything about whether or not they're retaining it or they're becoming more skilled or uh, how they're progressing through an entire course. So what it allows us to be able to do is to use that assessment data more effectively to guide um, any type of interventions that we that we will put in place to ensure that before students, say, for example, get, it, get to a point where they might be at risk for failure or performing at a lower level in terms of their overall grade uh, than they might be used to, uh, or to perform poorly on, on the MCAS test. Um, it'll allow us to, to put some interventions in place that are uh, based on a wider variety of data than just the student didn't do well on a couple of tests or they're not doing their homework. Um, the teachers have worked very hard in aligning uh, those questions both with our curriculum and um, also with the last three years worth of MCAS tests. So that the questions were really drawn from the pool of MCAS questions that we've had over the last couple of years, and they've done a really nice job of tying those back in. In addition, uh, using IXL uh, for the second quarter and third quarter assessments will, uh, as well as the other platforms that they've developed, will provide seventh and eighth grade students the opportunity to do computer-based assessments um, 
that are a little bit higher stakes. Uh, so they'll have practice in that format before they have to take the MCAS and the computer in the spring as well. So it, it allows us to be able to do a couple of different things in the dress. Um, it's also something that's going to allow us to be able to um, develop a, a, a set of tools <clears throat> to better evaluate the, uh, the alignment of our curriculum with instructional practices and with our assessments as well. Um, the next item that I wanted to be able to move on to uh, is directly related to this because some of this information gets brought into uh, the meetings that we have um, and it's around the, um, <coughs> the next agenda item but the uh, early warning indicator data. So in your packet through the graphs that show you one says HA early warning indicator data and this next graph refers to the uh, early warning data quarter one HA. And so there are a couple of structures that members of the faculty and uh, counseling team have put in place over the last couple of years. Uh, Ms. A couple of the teachers are here, Ms. Duncan, Ms. Roberts, have, uh, and, and everybody else in the middle school team have done a phenomenal job of, of hardening up um, regular meetings to discuss student progress monitoring. They call them student at risk meetings, but they're, they're really student progress monitoring. And basically, it's a, it's a standing child study team where uh, and they meet every other week. So the seventh grade will meet week one, week two is eighth grade, following week is seventh grade. So they meet every other week to do progress monitoring. So any student who is dealing with any type of concern can be raised. Um, notes are kept and disseminated through to the whole team, myself, the uh, counselors. Um, and nine through 12 meet weekly uh, with focusing on one grade level at a time. So the first week of the month is focused on ninth grade. Uh, the second week of the month is focused on 10th grade, and um, the third week of the month is focused on 11th and 12th grade. Mr. Beck, I'm sorry to interrupt you for just a moment, but it might be helpful because um, you are doing a great job of talking about, so what do we do with these data that I should explain? So what is early warning indicator system data? I should have yep. done that. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education looks at several factors that they've done tremendous research on that tells them students that, that have certain risk factors, they may have poor attendance, uh, they may be at greater risk because their first language is not English, they may be at greater risk because they're a student with a disability. Um, risk factors may uh, be a result of MCAS scores, uh, retention, so they look at different risk factors at different levels, in early elementary, upper elementary, middle school, and high school. And then based on those risk factors and statistical analysis, the department says which students they consider at high risk, moderate risk, or low risk. What you're looking at in the bar graph are numbers, not percentages. So in um, seventh grade at Hopkins Academy, based on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's data, 40, 40 students, not 40%, 40 students are considered low risk. Low risk means that 90% of those students are expected to meet the next benchmark, the, the next uh, academic performance benchmark. Um, seven students are considered at moderate risk. That means that 60% of those students are expected to, 40% may not, and if a student is considered in the high risk category, only 25% of those students are statistically likely to meet next, next benchmark. Benchmark, the first one is um, proficient or advanced uh, on third grade MCAS because that those are the, that's what they're looking at in early grades because that's a huge predictor for retention and on-time graduation. Um, it's not definitive, it's just a reliable predictor for that. Um, in um, middle school, they're looking at uh, middle school getting into um, uh, getting into high school on time, course completion, um, and in high school, on-time graduation. And uh, upper elementary is preparation for, um, is fully prepared for middle school. So sorry, that's what you're looking at. And so, you know, one of the things that um, is interesting about this data in the context of the, um, the standing progress monitoring uh, teams that are there is that there are very few students who are indicated on this list uh, as identified by the state and the state criteria as students who are um, you know, at risk potentially for not being successful in school. 
Yeah. There are so many. You have two who are high risk in all of Hawkins Academy right, right now. Right. That's state criteria. Um, and you can do that. Yeah. And so, you know, to give you an indication as to the thresholds and attention that the faculty pays to students and, and, and really putting this process in place and the initiative of teachers and counselors, uh, as well as the work of, of PATHEL, um, there are upwards of uh, 12 students between the 11th and 12th grade that we have had frequent conversations about over the course of the start of the school year. So our thresholds are very different. Uh, they don't they don't necessarily subvert these, but they're they're much more sophisticated, I think. And I think the process helps us to be able to, to be able to identify kids who really are you know in the 12th grade in that 31 of low risk before they ever shift categories. Um, in each of those circumstances, by the time a student is brought up in those meetings, very often a parent, parent contact um, or a parent meeting has already been scheduled or a family meeting is scheduled as a result of having gone to that meeting because there are certainly times where a, a student of concern is brought up at the meeting for the first time by somebody who's looking for insight from their colleagues on how they might help a student to improve or you know, be able to identify some strategies. From there, um, the child study pro process might begin, and uh, a student, uh, some some strategies might be put in place, although undocumented. And then in the follow-up conversation, people will get back together and talk about whether or not those things worked, um, what they've seen in terms of change, have they seen any additional progress from the student, um, and uh, a child study form at that particular point is is often filled out for a student where they haven't seen anything uh, improve from in, informal interventions. And then a process begins of really monitoring data over time. Um, and any member of the team can really make a recommendation to hold a formal child study team meeting using that data that they've accumulated um, and sometimes being able to identify the fact that a student might need some type of accommodations. We can do something less formal. Um, but nonetheless, it's distributed to all members of the teaching team to put some accommodations in place without having the student be on a plan such as a 504 or an IEP. Um, and a number of students have benefited from uh, the initiative of teachers to put some strategies in place that help students to be able to access the curriculum. As a result of that, they've stayed off of those plans uh, and been able to make progress or learn study skills or, or close those gaps. Um, but really, it, all the, those entire processes are, are intended really to identify and identify the underlying causes of the impediments to effective student progress, um, and then seeking to uh, close those gaps um, or create bridges to, to uh, prevent students from having to deal with those impediments and increasing access to the curriculum at a high level. From there, uh, certainly, um, a student could have. Uh, a disability identified and a recommendation could be made for a 504 or more complex testing might be requested and therefore a student might be determined to be eligible or not for uh, uh, the development of an IEP. Um, some of the academic interventions that uh, are common uh, really at any grade level uh, include the implementation of ac uh, an academic support period within a student's school day or if a student already has one uh, it might be supplemented by additional time um, making schedule changes uh, for students in the high school, putting off a graduation requirement, or in some cases doubling up in, in another year, or removing an elective from the schedule to provide an additional support course. Um, after school extra help, including the writing center that's overseen by um, the English department. Uh, skill specific assistance could be put in place, either formally or informally. Uh, things such as books on tape, graphic organizers for writing, the, youth, the, the use of uh, math reference or formula sheets uh, and things like that and there's we also have a, a secondary ELA support course for students at the high school level who have exhibited challenges with reading and writing. Um, in cases of uh, health and mental health the most frequent issue that we see that requires uh, progress monitoring of these teams or a more formal child study team have been issues of prolonged illness uh, and in many cases students who are still able to attend school but have the limitations from sports related or other injury related concussions, um, which have increased dramatically as we've done a better job of identifying those. Um, we do re entry meetings as students come back off of those illnesses with the nurse, the counselors, um, and people make determinations. The nurse and counselors will then send out those communications so that a student can have a soft re entry into school 
send out communications to everybody on the teaching team. Um, in cases where students deal with mental health issues, we uh, have our counselors and healthcare professionals work with outside providers to get releases so that they're able to get access to information from outside providers and then filter the important part of what teachers really need to be able to know to help students as they come back in and dealing with issues, say like of anxiety or other mental health issues that might be of concern. Um, so any, any questions about that process in, in general? And also just so the school committee, the two graphs that you have, the early warning data for <coughs> one, those are number of students not passing one or more courses first quarter. You can see from seventh through twelfth grade, there were ten students total that didn't pass uh, one or more courses. The reason that the totals do not match with the EWIS data is because the, e the early warning indicator system data from the department is put together in the spring of last year, and these are actual enrollments in first quarter reflections. And part of um, part of this uh, list of students in, in, in passing, you know, who do not pass one or more courses, that is also a little bit deceptive. But we're aware of it is that there are a small number of students who are still carrying incompletes um, and still need to wrap up quarter one courses because they were out with an extended illness, a concussion, or something along those lines. And so we're hopeful that none of those students end up in the not having passed the course comp. So any particular questions about that? No questions. So we have, we have post-secondary and SAT. Um, so the next couple of graphs are, um, these are, this is data that's pulled from, again, the Department of Education website. Um, and there are some things in here, for example, that you won't see. Um, in looking at um, SAT scores, you can see that the line that's below um, is the state average. And while we're very consistently uh, above the state average, we're obviously going to have huge fluctuations because we have a much smaller sample size if you have a group of 34 kids who are taking it as compared to you know 100,000 students across the state. They're obviously going to be much more stable when they're a larger group. So while we would anticipate some, some fluctuation, um, we, uh, we feel very comfortable um, with the fact that our students are um, performing quite well um, on the SAT. In, um, over the last couple of years, uh, Angie Cullen and our guidance director has noticed that there are a significant number of students who are taking the ACT rather than the SAT. So our sample size is at, uh, of students who are taking the SAT is actually declining. And um, the state doesn't actually gather information on the ACT test. In fact, there are some colleges out there who are moving away entirely from standardized tests as being part of their admission process. Uh, many of the Massachusetts State Schools, for example, um, are entirely negating um, the SAT and or the ACT as a requirement for admission. Um, and so an Angie will monitor that trend. Um, we don't have a formal SAT or ACT prep course that we offer either during the day, in the evening, in the weekends. We don't contract it out. However, um, Ms. Cullinan has put on the guidance website uh, and begins to work with students in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade uh, to share with them the link to Khan Academy's online prep, which is free to every student. Um, and all students uh, beginning uh, in the second half of the ninth grade year begin the, the process of post-secondary exploration much earlier on. So there's a really, what is a five-year curriculum uh, in grades seven through 11 for post-secondary exploration that includes everything from um, gap year to you know four-year private colleges to uh, looking at uh, vocational education to military options um, and looking at other licensure programs. I think Angie's done a phenomenal job of really expanding um, the information that's out there and available for students and families to get access to and really doing a nice job of getting students to explore and make use of the Navion system um, to go through a process not only of exploring uh, what college opportunities are out there for them, but also 
the um, the options that they have uh, available to them. And I think one of the things that she wanted me to be able to emphasize, and I said, well, it wasn't necessarily appropriate for this presentation because we weren't looking at the schools that students were going to over the last couple of years. We've seen a number of students who have gotten into really prestigious four-year colleges who have opted to go to community college for their first couple of years because they didn't get the financial aid that they needed to make that work. And so, um, at the very least, it's, it's, um, I think she's done a phenomenal job of just changing uh, our approach to counseling students and uh, combining that with individual parent meetings for every senior um, that begin at the end of the junior year. Um, as part of that process, there are two, two other graphs that um, are included in the packet. One is uh, above, been pretty consistently above the state average for the percentage of our graduates um, enrolled in post-secondary education and continuing after high school. And I think that this one, um, the persistence rates, <coughs> so our students are, are coming out of Hawkins and consistently successful in completing, uh, obtaining a college degree, well above the state average, I think, testifies to a couple of different things that we also hear about in our anecdotal conversations. One, that I think uh, Angie and the teachers um, do a phenomenal job of working with students to match them up really effectively with schools, with colleges, um, academically, socially, programmatically, um, that they're interested in and that will work well for them. So um, I think that process is very sophisticated and very complex, and I think that that data really provides uh, testimony of the effectiveness of the guidance, the work that's done by guidance. In addition, I think it, it provides a validation <coughs> for uh, the skill of our faculty and having students very well prepared to take on college. Um, and there's a great piece of anecdotal information that's come from our graduates who always come back, and they typically come back around Thanksgiving uh, at, for the first time. Uh, and they come in, and the first thing you ask, how's it going? And almost 100% of the time, 100%, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, college is so much easier than high school. Well, what do you mean? High school is just hard, and, you know? But we have a, I feel like I have a great academic foundation. I can, I have really good study skills. Um, I can read and write exceptionally well. Strong math background. I'm able to do pretty much whatever I want. College has come pretty easy to me. Um, and so we hear that consistently. Uh, one of the other pieces of information that has come our way, uh, although less formally, uh, oh, you know, as informally as, as those that anecdotal information, um, and something that will prompt us to take a look at our, our, our math programming, is that in the state of Massachusetts, in, in informal conversations that we've had with math professors, that our math curriculum goes up through, and, and all, in Massachusetts, it, it's a frameworks-related issue. It's not specific to the Hopkins Academy curriculum. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't uh, do more um, based on this information. That uh, a, a professor at a local college had a conversation. Uh, we had engaged in a conversation about the fact that students were struggling at the college level. We'd gone through high school pre-calculus under the Massachusetts frameworks. Um, were struggling at really high rates. Uh, one school in particular had more than 60% of their students in Calc 1 in college who at the midterm were failing the course. Um, the anecdotal information, that anecdotal information was combined for us with a parent who had come back to talk to us about um, the, the kid got through um, the early part of the course, but one of the things that they were able to share with us as a gap is that the concept of limits is no longer taught in, in pre-calculus under the Massachusetts frameworks. And the concept of limits is a foundation concept for understanding differentiation uh, in calculus. And so as we have our math department take a look at modifying and making changes to our curriculum, we'd like to find a way to kind of close that gap for our students so that we're in a, our kids graduate in a situation where any kid can go on and be very well prepared to take on Calc 1 without having to you know, get themselves exposed to a foundation concept coming out of high school because it doesn't exist in the frameworks. And the last piece of information is sharing um, the AP, the Advanced Placement Data. 
and our performance, our student performance on advanced placement tests. Um, the first graph um, shows the number of graduates from each graduating class who have successfully completed at least one AP course prior to graduation. Percent, this percent, not the, the I'm sorry, yeah, the, the percent of students within the graduating class. Um, one of the things that, that uh, we had just done a little bit of research on is you can see the number from 2011 um, goes from 26% from the class of 2011 up as high as 67% for the class of graduating class of 2016 who had successfully completed an advanced placement course. Um, for the class of 2018, when those students were sophomores, that was when our faculty made the decision to do two things. One, they removed all of the arbitrary grade prerequisites to get into advanced placement courses and began to actively recruit kids based on things like the PSAT, um, AP potential data, um, so that the, in the class of 2018, 77% of the class of 2018 have successfully completed an advanced placement course. And so we're hopeful, we think we'll see a little blip down uh, from the following graduating class, but we're hopeful that we're able to stay above 70% of our students. The thing also that that doesn't include is the work that Angie has done in, um, there are two students who didn't take advanced placement courses, but who have com successfully completed and are currently dual enrolled um, through hybrid programs. So uh, one of them is fully dual enrolled now, but took coll did college coursework last year. Um, so again, that's over 80% of the students in the class of 2018 <coughs> who have successfully completed college coursework. Um, I think there are a number of things that that really uh, provides testimony of. If you look at the next graph, um, and you look at the number of students who, uh, from each graduating class, the percentage, not the number, of, of students who achieved a score of three or higher, that those numbers are fairly strong. And you would expect or anticipate the possibility that when the population of students taking advanced placement courses might not be consistently kids that you would classify as being AP scholars, um, but kids that we have an obligation to turn into AP scholars, uh, I'm really impressed that we've not depressed the level of rigor at all in any of those <coughs> courses. However, the one thing that really needed to happen and that you can see happen on the other side, and if you look at that population, is one of the things that our faculty has done an excellent job of is they have increased the amount of support and the variety of supports that are available to students who have diverse learning needs. So any student really has an opportunity to go after those courses because I believe our faculty has made a really strong commitment to make sure that they have um, the resources that they need to be able to get access to that curriculum at this level instead of moving the curriculum down, which is exactly the kind of thing that you hope for when you open that up. You don't want to open up your, your most advanced courses and then have to teach toward the middle. So our teachers teach at a really high level, provide the support for our students to really be able to get to that level, and this data really provides confirmation that the, the, the teachers are really effectively doing that work. And so we hope to keep those trends going. So any questions on that? My only question on this chart, that is the one or two a better score, or three or five? Three or five. You're only five. eligible for, uh, if a college gives credit, you're eligible for college credit, but they only score three. So you, um, some colleges will, will ratchet that up. Thank you. And if you're wondering, what the hell are we looking at all of this, which I know that none of you are wondering now, but um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, one of the things that they evaluate the, the quality of the school district on are their post-secondary outcomes. All of these data are public data. Individual student data is not available to the public. These are all public data. And I often talk about, as we're getting near budget season, communities deserve to understand their return on investment. So the amount of money that we invest in our schools, what do we get as a result of those investments? In Hadley, we've invested in a high quality educate high quality educators, in a, in a robust teaching force, and small class sizes. And I think what you've seen is that of all the students at Hopkins Academy, only two are considered high risk by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. We go farther than that, um, the teachers and Mr. Beck go farther than that. 
identify any student that we fear might be at risk for a low academic achievement or low growth or for any other problem, and we immediately intervene. You can see his strategy document then shows how do we progress monitor, how do we stay on top of whether or not they're improving, if the supports are working. Um, that idea about return on investment, the idea that 80, you know, between 80 to 93 percent of our graduating classes enroll in college immediately upon graduation. So you can also do a filter analysis of 16 months after graduation, but immediately between 80 and 93 percent it ranges over the past several years. 94 percent persist from year one to year two. Again, that speaks to the quality of instruction, they're prepared for college, the quality of guidance and counseling services, they're picking the right colleges. And then they're <coughs> obtaining their degree at a rate of 78 to 79 percent in that first four years out, um, as opposed to the state average, which is between 55 and 65 in the years that you saw. So um, that's what the investment in um, small class sizes and the AP data that also show us that um, with 77% of our students this year looking at completing. And then last year's class, 70, we expect 77% of our students will have completed an AP course upon graduation. And when you look at that incline, again, of performance, that increasingly students are getting threes and fives, right, while we're opening up access. That can't happen without really highly personalized and effective instruction. That is a direct result of highly personalized and effective instruction. Um, so that's what taxpayers pay for, and um, that's the return on investment that they get. I just want to say thank you. This is very thorough, and it's always really encouraging to see, you know, when you think back of when you were in school and what you did and how you got to your college degree and whatnot, and just knowing the prep that these kids are getting, the rates that they're going into AP, and then the support that they're getting from guidance to really help them choose the right thing. That's, that's just great. Yeah, and I think a, a ton of the credit really needs to go to the faculty who not only, you know, this year as we engage in conversations about uh, collective definitions of rigor and, and, and engaging with those students, um, engaging students in those conversations that are really excited to have those conversations to be able to get everybody on the same page because I do believe that everybody has, we, we all have similar philosophies of we are, we're very open, we're not restrictive about uh, providing students access to the most challenging coursework that has them more competitive when they are measured up against their peers, but also has them far better prepared for being successful. Um, and that entirely uh, falls on the hard work and initiative of so many members of the faculty in a small school. I mean, we could have a number of people who may, for any reason, have just stood in the way of that, but this faculty just moved those things right out of the way and then began to identify the, um, the underlying causes of really why kids might not be successful and began to find ways to fill those gaps by really initiating or demanding that we get together and have conversations about how we can help solve these problems. So it all has to do with the quality of the faculty that we have here. A quick question, Brian. Well, maybe it's not so quick, but um, thanks as well. I'm looking at the strategy document from 2017 2018. And I don't know if any, if I'm wrong, right? this came out of a, uh, a retreat we had a year or two ago. So, all of the, the, the statement of purpose, vision, the expectation, and those strategic objectives are right. the same at Hadley Elementary and they're the same district wide. And what changes are the activities that support each one. Right. So that came out of the retreat. We'll have another one in the spring and do another three-year plan. And then each school identifies activities that align with those strategic objectives. And those strategic objectives are directly aligned to the standards and indicators of effective practice in the educator evaluation, administrator evaluation, and superintendent, superintendent evaluation document. And I know this is hard to do. I just wonder how you know, as the father of an 11 and 14 year old, how do I create someone that meets this vision? How do I help foster that, right? So somebody can contribute positively to a global society, safe, supportive environment, fosters cooperation, critical thinking, creativity, integrity, love of learning. I see the strategic activities, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily drive with the vision. Mm -hmm. Not that they're exclusive, mm -hmm. they're just not, I just wonder if you know, assessing quarterly math tests gets you to that vision. 
I don't know what else to be done, but I wonder, how mm -hmm. do you create someone who can contribute positively to global society, be a critical thinker and creative with integrity? What are those other strategic activities we could add? Well, I wonder if it goes back somehow to gathering that information on the student core values too, and just finding out from them what do they value, where are their um, their aspirations, and collecting that information as you described, I think helps to shape that. How do we get them there? Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, it's a challenge. I mean, that was our vision for what we have to offer, what they I mean, look like, and every student may be different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The eyes of the students sometimes are different than the eyes of the adults that teach them too. So I think it's I, I think it's a very or the adults that raise them. Or the adults that raise them. Which is why them. it's important to be able to get the input of parents on that too. Absolutely. Yeah. And a proactive approach in including the student and the plan that is ultimately their success to integrate them into society um, and have them positively contribute. It's important to include them in that discussion and get their ideas of what are your core values, what do you believe, how do you feel you can get there? Mm -hmm. And I think your question is the brain of the parents for us too. Right. Because mm -hmm. they're probably asking themselves the same type of question. How do I, how that student come out at the end of the year? Right. I mean, you can score well on these math assessments and still not meet that vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one does not forget the other, but I understand that's. That's essential. Scoring well on math test, I think, is important. Don't get me wrong. It's just really, is there more? And uh, if you can figure that out by next week, it'd be great, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Field trips. How about, I think the one I have, I'm not sure what's first in your packet. Do you have uh, from Susan Duncan, the school team, Nature's Classroom field trip? Yeah. All right. I picked the right one that was on top. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we want to go to the major classroom again this year. And um, it's great. We're still going back to Wake Road Island to the Salt Marsh. Um, June 4th through the 6th. Um, the cost every year obviously goes up um, for uh, the program fee there. And as well as um, we bring a nurse, we have to, we don't bring a nurse, we pay for a nurse there. Um, and then transportation. We are going to bring four teachers again, um, like we have in past years. Um, are we? Are you all familiar with Nature's Classroom? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So does anyone have any questions? I mean, it's a really great trip. I keep bringing them every year because I just love it so much. It's so great, not only that they hands-on learning, but really how they learn to work together mm -hmm. to get things done and um, just to be outside while we're doing all of that. It's just really great and getting away from technology, even though they fight us kicking and screaming to do that. I think it's really important that they get away from technology for a few here, days. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> My only question would be, um, given, I mean, our, our kids want to how are you Do you see, since this is kind of a long-standing annual trip, what kind of changes have you seen over the years, and what do you look forward to with this as potentially being different? I actually take, uh, read their feedback every year. Um, and take what they don't like. Um, sometimes you can, well, they just didn't like that activity, but most of the kids did. But I do take it, we do try to make it better every year. Like some of the activities they raved about, we've, like I've gotten rid of the kids got there and they were just like, no, this is not what we want to be doing. Um, they want to be building um, things and really active and learning why they're being active. And they love the dissection and, you know, so I've learned over the years that you know the first year when not enough kids got to do dissection, they were so upset. I have like a lot of variety, and they're great while we're there. Like if things aren't working out, um, they'll switch things around for us, which is really really great. Um, they also we can gear it towards the group of kids that we have. So if we have a more mature group of kids that might not get into the, you know, the really the fun but sort of quirky sort of learning where the, the counselors get all like these crazy names and want to be really like different. We could be like, hey, tone it down. These kids are, in this group of kids, a really mature group. You know, that was one of the years that was, that the kids really, I think I got a lot of feedback of things that I should change is that was a mature group and they didn't want that. So now they're really good. They just have to always asking, okay, so how can we accommodate this group of kids coming in every year? So they, and they're fabulous and they'll do it right there for me um, if we find that something's not working. 
So that part's really great. They're really great to work with. Good. Yeah, I don't have any questions no. about how it connects to the curriculum or anything. Yeah, I you're in this a great detail. Yeah, it's an overnight <laughs> uh, field trip, and as mm -hmm. per the policy, it requires school yeah. committee approval yeah. and a school committee vote. And uh, all of the folks who present their field trips, they also make sure in their <coughs> policy it states that they have to have parent guardian signed off, student sign off, uh, understanding what they're responsible for, and chaperone signed off. So they will take care of the other elements of the policy as well. I heard nothing but great stuff. The only comment I heard was about housing. It's like who got bumped with whom. Well, and that is always tricky. Always and I, we've made our mistakes <laughs> in the past. Um, we try to fix it. So, I, you know, again, I learn every year. I try to make sure the kids know on the bus ride down that um, if something's not going to their liking other, they need to come and tell us and we can fix it. If they don't tell us and we can't fix it. Um, so I really make a point to make sure the kids understand that before we get there. And since I've been, you know, I think that helps. Sometimes some kids still are a little um, wary about doing it, so we make sure we check in. You know, it's still bunking. It's still outdoors. It's still, you know, but... I've actually gone back to the cabins before and like cleaned and we've gotten them there to get the cobwebs out a little bit better and that sort of thing for the kids that are scared of spiders. So we do try the best we can, but they, they aren't like, it's not a hotel. Right. It's definitely outdoor. Um, they have heat, so it rains and that sort of thing. We can get dry, um, but it's, it's not a hotel. And I do try to, at least we're not, some of the kids think we're camping. I'm like, no, we're not camping. We, we're inside and we have running water and bathrooms and all of that which is really great, but um, it is, we do try to make sure that they are part of cleaning also. So we didn't, I just didn't go with the vacuum and do it, but I had them help me. Okay, we don't, too many cobwebs, let's go clean it up a little bit more, and they were really great. Yeah, okay. so. Do we need to take a vote? Yeah, we need a motion, a second, and a vote. Yeah, anybody want to offer a motion? A motion to approve the request for the Seventh grade students to participate in the nature's classroom field trip. All seven. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Thank Aye. you. Okay, I think next in your packet is New York City, am I right? Mm -hmm. okay. this one. New York City. This route. So Marilyn mm -hmm. Lindsay Roberts. Uh, so we take the kids on a two-day, one-night field trip to New York City and a little bit in New Jersey, but really just for the hotel. Uh, the events that, and the activities we go to is the Natural History Museum, Medieval Times, my favorite. If we have time, we're maybe go to Central Park, depends on the weather and what we do at the museum. Last year we spent the solid four hours there, we really saw everything, because that's where we get to tie into all of the components in our curriculum. Uh, math is not that much involved. Uh, I know that each teacher gave their curriculum standards that tie in, so you don't have to ask them specifically, you can always get in touch with them if you're curious a little bit more. But um, there is a lot there, the biodiversity, you know, the, the fossils, all of that ties in in different areas. We also go to Ellis Island, and we didn't get to do the Statue of Liberty last year, but we are going to try and mix it up this year and definitely get that in. And then we end the trip at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, which was fabulous because we have about two and a half hours there which is more than enough to really see everything. Um, right now, there should be two chaperones that are teachers. We have two parents who have volunteered that are registered nurses to make sure that we are absolutely covered, and that keeps the cost of the trip low. Uh, speaking of cost of the trip, right now, uh, we're about in 35 to 40 range. We have 42 kids max in the eighth grade. They all went. It says 369 per person for quads. Uh, I believe we got approved from the trustees for bus fare, so that should bring the trip, the cost of the trip down about $60 per person. We've already done one fundraiser that wrapped up today. I know between both the seventh grade and eighth grade, they raised $4,300 <coughs> for both of our trips. Uh, and I know a few of our kids raised about $240. That goes directly to their trip. So it's pretty awesome. We are planning another fundraiser. That will probably be like a dine-in night so that we can do the overall cost of the trip and try and get it down as cheap as possible. Hopefully under $300, which covers hotel, all of the activities, dinner the first night at Medieval Times, breakfast the next morning, and the bus and gratuities and all of that. Do you guys have any questions for me? I know both of you guys will last here. Yeah, my only comment from last year was that I know the schedule is ambitious. So. It is, it is, yes. Um, it's good to see, it looks like some changes were made to yes. account for that, but I'm glad to see some of these things are still on there. 
Yes, I think a lot of it is really important. They're kind of like big staples in New York, so it's, there's so much to see, and there's many more things I wish we could do. I wish we could go see Hamilton and all that, but <laughs> it's nice kind of hit, like I said, the landmark yeah. of New York, and I it was very unfortunate. that ticket will be more than the cost of the trip. Yeah. yeah, the travel agent, the first year we looked into this, did offer that. And she really? said, they're about $200 each. I was like, well, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. But that was right before it got as big as it is now. Sad to get tickets. Yeah. So, yes, I agree. It was unfortunate. Being the first year, it's nice to know now that we should do the Statue of Liberty first, and then we go to Ellis Island. I think we're going to stay in one large group, because I think the problem was that some of the like, group leaders were distracted in certain areas, so I'm going to try and do a better job of keeping us together there, so we can see the important things, but also go to the Statue of Liberty, because mm -hmm. that's yeah. a fan favorite. <laughs> are, are there any activities you do to kind of prepare the kids for the 9-11 Memorial and Museum? Because it's, it's pretty rough. It is. Last year, and we'll most likely do it every year that we want to do this trip, um, we had like a big grade meeting in my room. As the history teacher, I have like a presentation. We kind of go over, you know, what happened, the aftermath. And I don't give too much away because there's so much at the museum that they can learn from. But we definitely give them an overview and prepare them. That's kind of my biggest point is yeah, there's a lot, it's overwhelming, it's very educational, but it is you know, a tragic event that occurred. So we do something as an entire grade. Ms. Gallagher usually brings them down from health and they come up from gym. So we try our best to prepare them and educate them. Medieval times, all the other stuff, we kind of like it works our way in, but that specifically we do a special presentation for since it's not in the ancient history curriculum. Right. Next, we have the Quebec Winter Carnival Field Trip Proposal, revived, revived by two, one second year faculty, one fourth year faculty, right? right. So, revived because I don't think we're going to, we're not going this year, so revived no, next, next year. year. Yeah. Uh, bonjour, yes. <laughs> je m'appelle <laughs> Monsieur Odantil. Et bonjour, uh, je m'appelle Mademoiselle Lynch. Uh, je suis la professeur de français à Hopkins. Yeah, and uh, I can tell family to <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I, that's what I got for you. We'll learn more French. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll watch those old videos I did in college. Yeah, um, <laughs> tell me français. Yeah. Um, so. This is the first proposal I put together for a field trip that's an overnight field trip. Um, this is the field trip that traditionally uh, Madame Robert had run every other year or so um, when she was uh, the, our French teacher prior to uh, Mademoiselle Lynch that's here now. Um, it's a trip that I heard many wonderful things about from students, particularly those who are graduating this year. They really enjoyed being able to go on a trip that is closer and less expensive traditionally than like a larger trip that might be a trip to Europe, which is also available for students. Um, this would be an offer for my, my part in it with being uh, international foods and food and nutrition and those kind of things like that. A lot of it is, a, we, I teach a lot about the cultural experiences that students have combined with then foreign language. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, I didn't really quite know how to connected, well, I did put a lot of linkages to all the different curriculum frameworks that are going to talk about language and learning about culture and comparison and then also uh, learning different objectives around uh, consumer science stuff around like learning about the economic and ecological and different types of cultural exchange information we do cooking and, and cook stuff <coughs> based from lots of cultures and also French food and uh, Brianna has come in with her French class in my class and uh, made crepes, which inspired my students to want to make crepes. <laughs> we hear about beaver tail, which I had no idea what that was, but apparently it's fried dough. Um, anyway, so the idea is for us to go uh, for um, three nights and four days to uh, Montreal, to or Quebec, um, for their winter carnival, which is their giant big uh, winter celebration that happens in January. It's, for, it's two weeks long in January. Um, and would be taking them to do a whole bunch of fun and exciting um, adventures where they would be able to, even for students that don't speak French, it's 
something that we can that students can still be engaged in and, and learn about. Um, learn about like the cultural exchange. Uh, we'd be doing um, the the festival itself, which has tons of fireworks. It's cross. It's there's ice sculptures. It's yeah. ice castle. I've I've been. I went a couple years ago. It's a fabulous experience. It is cold, but <laughs> there's so much to do, so much to see. It's a great experience for French students to practice their French and get some practical applications. So it's, that's the hardest part of learning foreign language. Yeah. Um, there's also a lot of really oppor uh, opportunities where we'd be going to like um, the National Cathedral in, in Montreal mm -hmm. and um, art museums. Uh, we'd also be doing fun stuff for the kids that want to like just be like, let's do some fun outdoor stuff. Where they be, we'd be going on a dog sledding trip and also on like a tobogganing trip where they get to go up and do some nice fun stuff. Um, so the the opportunities are really kind of like to mix fun and school um, work and learning and being able to try different cultural cuisines and different types of things where students who might not be like, I've never thought about traveling abroad, this might be a taste for students because it's open for 9th through 12th graders. So anybody who wants to, that's either an early language learner, whether it's French or Spanish, there's also you know opportunities for me to learn and us to learn so there's a collaborative kind of thing for French students to be able to kind of help coach and teach Spanish speakers, uh, language speakers. Um, so we're asking for approval. Um, I have the different right rates and such that uh, would cost depending upon how many students. Um, in my naivete, I tried to pull it off to do it this January, which I found out really couldn't do because all the seniors are graduating went and we're super so excited. They're like, we want to do that for our last trip. That would be so amazing for all of us to be able to go again. We had such a great time when we were in ninth grade when we went last time. But unfortunately, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So um, I want to try to offer that opportunity for other students that had heard about it or might have gone on it or had older siblings that went on it as well. Um, so the, it, I already had 27, 28 or 29 students that had expressed interest. Mm -hmm. um, and out of those, seven of them would be graduating this year. So I still have a lot of folks and parents who actually asked me about it during uh, parent-teacher night. About and we could wanting potentially to do that. have current eighth graders. Who yeah, are current eighth graders who are taking money in general be able to, to go on that trip as well. So it's priced out. I have several uh, ideas for different types of uh, fundraisers that we can do with like poinsettia sales, bake sales, a lot of different types of dine outs and other ideas that we can do to do some fundraising to defray and defer the cost um, for students, uh, as well as like organizing and coordinating with Mr. Sudnick and other types of things that we need to do administratively, parent meetings um, and whatnot. So that's what we're here asking for um, approval to start getting the ball rolling with a little over a year out to go to start getting kids interested, invested, and fundraising for this trip. This is January 2019. 2019, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that regardless of the number of students, are we talking about just it being Hopkins students, or would you, if you were short on students, open it up to you? Or? No, yeah, we did this, if this level would be just for Hopkins okay. students, 9 through 12 mm -hmm. um, graders because middle schoolers have other stuff that they get to go on that's fun and kind of often sometimes there are students that don't have an opportunity to go on a field trip that's if a class doesn't go on a trip that year for some reason or things like that. So yeah, just for high school age students. So is that midweek, those days? No, it would be a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we coordinate with, and uh, when I looked at it this year, we'd be planning around doing it during uh, midterm exam weeks so that midterm exams could be done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and students could leave Thursday and Friday because Thursdays are generally um, elective courses, so they would be able to coordinate and have plenty of advanced learning <coughs> with teachers if they had an exam that was scheduled for that Thursday. Friday is traditionally a half day that day for makeup exams, so it would be placed in a way that students wouldn't be missing any of time on learning in classroom situations, but they would also then be doing this time on learning in a, in a different way, in a multicultural sense. Any other questions? Sounds great. Any questions? That sounds cool. All right. Uh, do we have a motion? A motion to approve the um, request for approval for the Quebec Winter Carnival field trip proposal scheduled for January of 2019. Second. 
No, okay. Aye. Thanks. Good yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And lastly, our avid one this evening, <coughs> Mr. Bartlett. We distributed this at the beginning of the meeting, and Mr. Bartlett will tell us about the high school on Sunrise to come to New York City. On Sunrise. Like Hello, his folks. voice, right? So, um, a really proud tradition of the Hopkins Music Department has been travel, and you can see evidence of that kind of all over the room. And uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure, you know, the camera up a little bit. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to make sure that I uh, started again when I started here last year was really trying to get the band, and actually the chorus as well, out on the road to experience all of the things that music has to offer them. So. In that uh, spirit, I'm proposing a trip to New York City to participate in what's called a Heritage Festival, uh, put on by this great company, World Strides. Um, and it really gives the students an opportunity to perform and to sort of get out of this, this room here and mm -hmm. uh, perform their art out for a, a novel audience. And uh, uh, the proposed dates for this trip would be May uh, 3rd to the 6th, which I believe is four days, three nights. Um, it does not uh, <laughs> conflict with any testing. May is a an interesting month to try to schedule things in, but we managed to squeeze in. Mm -hmm. um, the festival package that I'm proposing includes the festival participation, which is a great um, opportunity for them to get up on stage and play for um, people from all over the country, uh, including professionals who will give them really good feedback, positive, constructive feedback based on their own merits, not being uh, in competition with anyone else. And uh, we get those recordings and we can sort of review and reflect and use those things to make us a stronger uh, stronger music program. Um, they do include the lodging, um, but I'm, I'm sort of trying to seek alternate routes for the lodging, and so far that's going quite well um, to bring the cost down a bit, because the, the cost is relatively impressive, as I'm sure you may imagine. Um, the, the final uh, sort of capstone on all this is a, a nice circle line tour with a buffet dinner where the kids actually get to interact with one another um, in this really nice sort of dance, casual setting. So our students here will get to meet students from around the country they would not necessarily have kind of come into contact with otherwise, which I think is a wonderful opportunity. Um, my favorite part about this is uh, the, this AIM masterclass experience, which uh, means that our students, both band and course, will get to sit in with a college professor and really get into some musical learning, which I, they don't have a choice on this one, they're going fantastic. <laughs> um, I can't That's wait. <laughs> um, and the tour, on top of this, the tour company offers a lot of other excursions. We'll see how that goes. Um, in, in the uh, handout I've given you, I have uh, two quotes. I have one for sort of everything, mm -hmm. which brings the costs up very, very high. And I have one which is very bare bones, giving us the freedom to sort of experience New York in a much different uh, sort of respect and perhaps more in a musical light, because they don't offer a lot of musical excursions, and if this is going to be a music department trip, there should be some musical programming in there, I think, especially in New York. Mm -hmm. All of the wonderful opportunities to see musical things. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I gave a breakdown. The less expensive packages at this moment will be uh, 534 per student, and the more expensive will be 716. The bulk of that is the lodging, and I think I can get that down by at least half, just the lodging part of it, by going directly to the hotels myself. Uh, which is an option mm -hmm. I'm going to take advantage of. <laughs> um, the educational benefits are kind of expressed both in the obvious way and the less obvious way. You have a chance to receive constructive feedback, like I said. Um, they get to uh, play out not only for these professionals, not only for those assembled, but also for other students mm -hmm. who are in the same kind of programs that they're in. And then vice versa, they get to sit and watch a band from Texas play very similar music to what we're playing and see how they interpret it. And being that it is such a, an objective art, it would be subjective, right? It would be a really great experience. Um, that master class, the AIM experience, I, <laughs> I, still, I get excited about it just thinking about it. And um, there's other, also these other things that are there sort of just by virtue of going. They'll get to see um, all these other kids, similar interests. To be in New York in and of itself, uh, it's, it's a wonderful chance. Uh, all of the art, the culture, the food, everything that you get to experience, being there is worth it almost just for that. Um, they get to go with one another. I've been on trips like this, and half the fun is the bus trip there. <laughs> you get to know the people uh, in a very small space. One would think it would be like a pressure cooker eventually, but no, everyone gets along really well, and the, 
the bonds that these students form on trips like this actually makes the ensemble stronger, makes the ensemble better. Band is a team, chorus is a team, just like any other. It uh, really, really depends on those relationships between the students and between me and the students. Um, and then get a taste of life outside of Hadley. Hadley's a wonderful town. I grew up in a town just like this. But there's something to be said for going out and seeing what else, what the rest of the world has to offer. Um, so really, the sum of all of this is they get to go out, experience the city, experience what it's like to play in front of, like in a proper concert hall, in front of a nice assembled audience, and uh, they get feedback from some of the best practitioners in the country. Uh, they get the master class, which I think I'll talk about until the day I die. Uh, <laughs> and um, just to be in this cultural center, it, it, the argument can be made that it's the cultural center of the entire country. Um, to just be there as a musician and experience it as a musician is just a wonderful opportunity. So this would be a band and the chorus, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's up where it's a 50 some odd people? Yeah, it's uh, 49 students and uh, I, I'm aiming for uh, myself and then five other adults because I feel like that's a good number to have. Uh, the more the merrier. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll my flute. <laughs> My wife's already taking your time. You play your flute while cool. speaking French. French. I play violin. I can play <laughs> French. So this is just a, a, a jump possible itinerary. Yeah, yeah this is. The, I, I've also included. I'm sorry. I included a sample itinerary um, in uh, the back of the front page there. Uh, this is just an example of all the things the kids can get up to while they're there. I really am tempted to do less of their program stuff and really let the like individual group leaders and their students really go out and experience the city as they see fit. Um, there's so much to do there. I really hate to limit kids and adults and anybody else who wants to go see uh, as they see fit. I, I don't want to limit that. And I really want to, like I said, I want to get a musical thing in here. A Broadway show is great. Um, I love Broadway shows, but there's a, uh, you have so many wonderful ensembles that operate in New York. Um, mm -hmm. If we're going to be a music department, we should see some musical things. Mm -hmm. Did you see, sorry, did you talk about the need for fundraising? Yeah, so um, we're already uh, currently uh, in the middle of our calendar fundraiser, the, the Hadley calendar fundraiser, which is a staple here. And uh, we sort of kicked that off at the Hadley, uh, the, the Mother's Day fair, the holiday fair. And I think this, at just the holiday fair alone, I think we outsold our entire last year in calendars and band cards as well. Um, the band cards is our next step, another thing that folks in the community have come to expect. And I think we sold all but 50 of them, and I think we got 500. We were, were yeah, in the ground yeah, running this year. <laughs> I have one student who sold 65 by himself. So uh, that alone, we've already outpaced our fundraising um, for all of last year in one event. Uh, the students are ready to go. And then there's other things we want to do, sort of specifically musical things. Um, Principal Beck brought up a great opportunity, uh, possibly doing something like a Hadley's Got Talent kind of thing, where we showcase the talents of the town at large, not just the Hopkins students. I think that's a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then I proposed last year uh, something of a cabaret night, where we put small musical acts together, or small theatrical acts together, and we just present them to the town. Uh, we can present baked goods and things like that. And it, these, are, these are musical things that I think really connects the community with the, the <laughs> unbelievable musical talent in this building. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think having a trip like this to look forward to is so motivating for the kids. Like they'll want to do that and have these got talent, they'll want to do a cabaret night because it's like in this trip, you know, that's coming where they get to perform, have the master class and kind of showcase their talents. Um, I think as you get more info on the hotel and kind of lock down where that'll be, mm -hmm. that's a big factor with the transportation and the time. Um, and you'll want to just tighten up the agenda in terms of what is on the schedule. Because there's a lot of options, obviously, that you said, but you are going to want to probably set, okay, festivals this day, this day is sightseeing, and here's the here's what we're doing, or here, you know, let the students pick and kind of arrange it ahead of time. But I'm in support of it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, me too. I love the energy. I'm, I'm curious, do you want to see it again, or are you just sort of, okay, Lesson in and they'll figure out the details. 
I don't think I need to see it again. Um, I know I'll see it again in the side of this book. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, I think the concept the links to the curriculum are there. I think it's just more working out the details of, you know, who and what and their staying, things like that. Is it okay having a Yes, and also yeah, Mr. Really Bartlett sure. has not only um, so access to people who have done a lot of these trips, right? So have experience with this, and the staff would be helpful in terms of what makes the most sense. Having a much tighter agenda or having a looser agenda. There are folks who've taken students around that could weigh in and say, in theory, that seems like a good idea, but maybe it isn't. I don't know. So certainly, I think you should feel comfortable if you're in approval of what you see, if you want to approve what you see, and then there are plenty of resources to get the details straightened out. So I agree with the trip. I went on two band trips when I was in high school at Hopkins, and those are some of my fondest memories here. So I think it's awesome, and you're absolutely right. The energy that is in the band is phenomenal. It's I, Sports are great, and they're wonderful, and they're exciting, and they're but there's something about Hopkins Academy band that like really gets you like your feet tapping and so I think I'm excited. <laughs> excited for you. <laughs> there is a funny you are excited. It's like I approve. That's right. I do. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun. Yeah. I guess you don't. <laughs> I guess. All right. Motion. Um, on the motion to approve the Hopkins Academy High School ensembles. Trip to New York City from May 18th. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank I was just thinking, we were just talking about the strategic vision, creating a global citizen. I think there's a few things like travel and yeah. doing So thank you all for taking the initiative. I will also say, I was thinking about it, we've been doing a lot more inside the school. I mean, these are all options for kids. We've been doing a lot more assemblies kind of breakout sessions where they, I mean, recently they got to meet educators from all over the world and discuss what it's like to teach in Pakistan and Chad. There was, I think, five or six people. Yep. We had a you know, Syrian refugee. We had the Multicultural Day last year. So I think we're making progress. And we're trying to do it as often as possible. That's awesome. So I just wanted to mention that, that we are right. trying to take those steps because I think everyone's in agreement on the faculty that the more that we let them experience, the better they're going to be as humans in the world. Exactly. Thank you. And I probably should have pointed that out. That's actually under B on the Is activities. Sorry, I missed it. Continuation of student diversity club activities that foster social justice and equity examples, including the refugee speaker and the whole school assembly. I didn't really know what that meant. Speakers so. on limited educational opportunities in the developing world, um, which are some of the, <laughs> the ongoing. Um, because it's more than one, right? It's more than one on the teachers from around the board. Yeah, it was like five or six. Yeah, there was quite a few. That's great. That's cool. Great. Yeah, thank you all that. for taking me. Yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And thank you for your fellow presentations. I really appreciate it. shape financially. He did want to point out if you, for example, look at page seven of your budget summary report, and if you go to tuition to non-public, no, uh, yeah, tuition to non-public schools, and it appears that you're running a $500,000 deficit, which wait till I give you Chris's comment on the revolving account. So I'm like, every time I present, how does this happen when I present? There is a glitch in the software, and you might, so a couple of things are happening here. If you look at the originally, the budgeted amount, our total budget for tuition, this is the one that sometimes we're budgeting at $850,000. Mm. So why is it so low here? Because this only shows what's budgeted in the local operating. So some of that is covered with school choice. We vote at the end of the year to transfer over school choice funds. Some of it is covered in grants, the 240 grant, circuit breaker. And so the budget side is just what is the local budget side. 
Um, the expenses, though, then are the actual expenses. So the expenses are outpacing because we haven't transferred or applied any of the grant funds. But in addition to that, there is a glitch. So what's happening is that on the encumbered side, and this happened in a couple of places, it happened here, it happened with electricity, and so Chris is looking at that and is going to um, get it fixed. What should happen, you encumber the total amount for the tuition for a year. As you pay the cost monthly, your expenses go up and your encumbrance should go down, right? Every time you take a month off. Right. That's not happening in some of the lines. And so that's where you're seeing we are not running a $487,000 deficit on that line. But because I'm presenting it to you this evening, it would have been <laughs> are. But we are not. So um, that the same that was for transportation? No, that's the same for special education transportation, exactly. And it also happened in electricity. It didn't happen in every line, but in some lines, the encumbrances are not, the system isn't drawing down on the incumbent side. So thanks for that. I was wondering. Uh, I was going to ask Chris sure. about, uh, <laughs> Since he's been here, I'll ask you because I know right. you're an expert on oh, yeah. things. Uh, the air conditioners again. Oh, oh yes, I have that here. Yeah. I do. Yes. All right. Good. Okay. Well, Chris, uh, field and air conditioning. I do want to make sure I don't forget the grant report, but yes. field and air conditioning. So the HES air conditioning project will go out to bid in January. Um, and the hope, as Chris had indicated before, is that we would get better pricing. Right. He's changing the specs to require pricing for one, two, and all three wings of the building. Excellent. So that's going to enable the district to get prices if, in fact, we could afford to do a part of the building. And then we ended up requesting additional money to complete right. it. So that'll be the next um, time we go out to bid. We'll, we'll ask them to submit bids that parse out the project. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and so the grant report, which is in your packet, uh, we will be, so the Title IIA Teacher Quality Grant supports our faculty that uh, provide school-wide supports, behavioral intervention supports at the elementary school, and reading supports. Uh, that's not their total <coughs> salaries for two people. That's just a portion of their salaries are expensed against this grant, so that's completely expensed. Uh, you can see IDEA 240 and Circuit Breaker. There's a lot in those grants. That money is applied against those um, tuition for non-public schools. Early childhood, we will spend. We haven't started spending. Unfortunately, special education program improvement, we were holding our breath and waiting for it. And it appears that both 274 and 298 are not going to be funded at all. That's roughly about $7,000. that state or federal? Um, so they are state grants, but um, those are state grants. They're not pass-through grants. Typically, the federal grants uh, title, circuit breaker, if you see title, it's a federal title. It's from legislation. IDEA, title grants, and circuit breaker. Um, and the other ones are state grants. Um, it, sometimes state grants, it's connected to federal priorities, even if they're state grants, right? So cuts at the federal level mean that the state might change their agenda, and that has an impact on us. Uh, so additional updates on the fields. There's also a timeline. Um, you know, I'm going to get to that in a moment, so I don't so I don't lose track. Let me, if I may, the revolving reports. Um, I pass that out for you. Revolving reports. I think you got it. There are notes at the bottom of the revolving report for you, but I'd like to go ahead and read what Chris wrote on mine. The lunch account is Anne's fault. 100% on her. Isn't it funny that she always delivers bad financial news to you? Have no fear. I'll be back next month. And there will no doubt be better news. Chris. That's the note on mine. <laughs> but, um, you can see that uh, the negative balance on lunch, every time I'm charged with this, there's a negative balance on lunch. It's because the revenues from the federal government weren't posted on the town side in time. Um, and uh, so they're waiting for that federal money for payment and uh, also for things to get posted. Uh, so now it's showing a negative 7,000, but uh, he anticipates at the end of December the account will be up to date in the 15 to $17,000 range. Of course it will be because he will be back. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what you'll see then. I'm just curious why the athletic money went down. Is that for the... Um the, uh, Two things. Scoreboard, scoreboard has an impact on that. And of course, you don't see soccer doesn't have any gate money. Basketball will bring in gate money, so right. there will be more revenues. Part of it is scoreboard. We also have um, an optional. So if students, students may choose to go home before a game or before a practice, but if they don't, we have a supervised study support 
that is so senora runs that and if students stay they can do homework they can um, get help is that mandatory do they have to go there if we if they are on campus yeah. we ask them to be there if they're right. on campus yeah, okay. um and that's there's for obvious reason reasons some parents were concerned the message was not that students were untrustworthy or it's it's really about student safety i mean think about it they're we don't let students wander about unsupervised at any other time during the day. So, um, and they can get extra help. There's a certified teacher there. If they have homework, they can do. And we're hoping to help them with time management. So we, we hope in that too. Yeah. <laughs> the field. We have a timeline and some soil testing summary for you. So where are we at? The soil testing is finished. You can see um, I provided you with the executive summary. The <laughs> highlights from the executive summary are really nothing found. So for example, I'm saying this for the benefit of the viewing public, no evidence of former or current underground or above ground petroleum or hazardous material storage tanks was noted during property inspections. No that must be a typo unless there's such a thing as surficial spillage. Ground staining or stressed vegetation indicated a release to surface oils. Uh, surface soils. Um, then they go through each of the properties within one quarter mile and indicate that for all of those properties, they don't foresee an impact to the subject site based on Mass Association, the Department of Environmental Protection of Massachusetts closure and oversight. So. Uh, there are no, based on historical information and site inspections, current surf, no, that must be the actual word, surficial site conditions do not constitute a release or pose a threat of release of petroleum or hazardous materials as designed, defined by Massachusetts general law. The soil testing is done. We paid for the soil testing out of the operating budget. Remember, the CPA said that before any money could be released from CPA, the school department had to spend some of its own money. That's one expense we've covered. And the bid specifications will be the next expense that we cover. And we have, Chris has been in contact with Berkshire Design because um, we need to get the bid specs done. And then you can see we anticipate advertising the bid January through February, awarding the bid in February. Um, fundraising has started and will continue and looking to then begin construction in spring of 2018. Um, with an end, oh Paul, you're gonna have to help me with that. With an end of fall of 2019, but the fields wouldn't be, you wouldn't be and playing on them until the following exactly. year. Exactly, yeah. just, just the time for the turf to grow. Yeah. Um, so those are all of Thank Chris's you. updates. Awesome. What are we on to next? How about, Gender equity? I don't know if we're Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I told you, uh, the lieu of town financial management team, I just want to update you on asbestos and water and update the town. So we have had um, a very thorough inspection of uh, asbestos in this building. I mean, this is uh, Hadley Elementary School. It's obviously a much newer build. This building in the greenhouse. Every single thing that was uh, cited as a potential issue in the last inspection, and that inspection occurred in 2016, although we were given timelines, some things had to be completed um, almost immediately, and some things we had until December of 2018, everything on the list has been addressed, everything. When they do their annual inspection, which they just did this last Monday, they came back again. They went through all 70 pages of that report. They were here from uh, 1 in the afternoon until 8 p.m. at night with Jeff Mish, uh, walking through everything and looking at everything. And um, there were no issues. And those asbestos reports are on file in the superintendent's office, and they're available for public viewing if anybody wants to see them. We don't have a written report from Monday yet. We will, and it will be in that binder. Water testing. We participate in the town water program for lead testing. <coughs> that means every three years. They're on alternate schedules, but this campus or Hadley Elementary School receives water testing in accordance with Massachusetts state law and regulation. Now, water testing does not test every single faucet. It tests drinking faucet, um, it tests some faucets. But in addition to that, we do our own independent testing. So we did Hopkins last year, every single faucet that you would get drinking water from. That's when we discovered that we had two Drinking fountains that if you flush them, um, but we close them immediately after a 30 second flush or 
it's written in the report, the actionable level of lead went away. I would also tell you, we closed those fountains immediately. They weren't widely used. They're the ones, the original ones, where you have to like, stick your head in the wall to get a drink of water. Nobody uses those fountains. It's <laughs> okay, the right line. But they were replaced. So they were initially closed. They've been replaced. Um, and in winter break, over winter break, we will test every drinking source I've had at the elementary school. So we, we don't participate in the state program. Um, we do our own independent testing. That way we can be sure we get it done every faucet, every other campus, every year, um, which is far above what the state So requires. by replacing just the fountain, that rectified the issue? By replacing the fountain and the, you couldn't get to the pipes the way those fountains are, they're into the wall. You know, it's that, unlike the new ones where you can actually get to things. So it was replacing the fountain and all the supporting those pipes that were in those particular fountains, which doesn't, because because the levels went away after a flush, it was it probably had a lot to do with lack of use. But again, the students just don't use those fountains, but they have been replaced. Um, so that's asbestos and water. I get all the fun stuff to talk about. So how about gender equity? That's actually fun. Have there been any talk or any thought uh, ask of the filtered water fountains that you see now around airports and such? We haven't talked about that. No, we haven't. We we haven't considered that. And not for not we haven't said no we don't want to do that. It's just not something that we thought about. So okay. perhaps we should. There's the added cost, I'm sure they're more expensive than they mm -hmm. to maintain them. You have to change a filter. Yeah, if, if Mr. Mish is watching this right now and he's saying, <laughs> what is you Perhaps yeah. we should. I just replaced two water it. fountains. Oh, no, right. perhaps we should not. I just bought new water fountains out of my budget. <laughs> right. okay. I'll tell him you said we get there, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all about it. Yeah. Um, so gender equity. This I do want to prepare you for something I'll be asking for your input on. This is part of much larger work, right, around social justice and equity. And we started talking about this my first year here, and um, that conversation was important, productive, and it, sometimes it was really difficult. And that was when we had an article in the Gazette, and it was it, it proved the conversation very important, very worthwhile, and it was challenging because I believe the newspaper article kind of caught us off guard um, in terms of how do we how do we talk about honestly and openly about what every child's experiences in the school and how do we um, establish where what kind of community we want to be honestly assess where we are in relation to our aspiration and how do we move toward that aspiration so i think we've learned something as you all know last year many young ladies uh, women at our school had a sit-in talked about conditions that they thought weren't working for them and so as we've been thinking about social justice work we've been talking about you know, there's three major components. This is overly simplistic, but just a way for us to organize our thinking. And one of those components is certainly action. So it's not enough just to describe conditions that are unacceptable, but um, folks who find those conditions unacceptable, those who are most affected and those who don't want to participate even implicitly in an unjust environment, we have to take action. If you just describe conditions, we'll just become despondent. And as you know, the students immediately started taking action. They brought to you recommended revisions to the student handbook. They created a faculty reporting network. So they've done a great job with that. And then we see these two other pieces. One of them is, is recognizing our, our current reality and being honest about the ways in which individuals or the institution has, has not done enough to, to meet our ideal, right? And where students have experienced things that that in, don't feel like what we claim we want to be. And that is the part that they're in right now. Um, the next part in the spring will be more of a traditional positive social norms campaign where we start identifying, hey, look, you know, like 90% of students report that they, you know, feel that there's equity in the school or more traditional social norms campaign. We've, we've, we believe that if you leave out either part of that, so if we only focus on the positive social norms, the people for whom that doesn't reflect their reality feel invisible, diminished, ignored, and they disengage. And if we only describe a reality 
where it's not meeting what we hope to be. Those people who are, who are actually trying hard to create that feel like they're invisible and ignored and they disengage. And if our ultimate goal is a real conversation and working together, then nobody can disengage. So uh, we're at the recognized sexism part. Thank you, Tom Pitta, for helping us with this. Uh, a lot of students had their photos taken. The photos are fantastic. I've seen them. We have some money that will be framing these, and they will debut at our uh, alumni basketball game. Just remember, one of the issues was that women felt, young women felt as though there wasn't as much community support for women's girls' sports. Um, so they're hosting an alumni basketball game that both um, the boys will be playing. It's an event the girls will be playing, and they're going to unveil the Recognize Sexism campaign. There are photos. The women and men talked about things where there was gender stereotyping that they'd experienced in their life. And so there's quotes underneath each one of the pictures. Tomorrow, so you get the spoiler alert, I will be emailing the school committee just the quotes because I want you, if you have any like, e I don't know, I'm not sure, I want to hear from you. Um, uh, if you have any questions, any concerns, or you think there's a lack of clarity, I'd certainly want to hear from you. You can email me directly. So you'll just get the quotes, no names, no pictures, just the quotes. Um, and uh, they also have a hashtag, recognize sexism. So here I'd like your input. And you can talk now. You can also just think about it and email me. And, and in an effort not to violate open meeting law, you can email me individually. So here are my concerns about the hashtag. Um, they want to use Instagram. I don't use Instagram. I'm not, I don't really know how it works, but they've explained it to me how it works. Um, so they were going to have the hashtag Instagram. People could follow, people could comment. Uh, my inclination, and I completely felt like, I don't know, the Luddite stereotypical, I shouldn't even say it, I mean, there are plenty of people, grandparents are way more technologically advanced than I am, so just a Luddite is what I felt like. I wanted to, I want to shut off all comments on it because, and this is I think that, my thinking, um, my fear is that I don't, if I can't control how people are going to respond to these images, I don't want to in any way have potentially set up a student or um, someone being unkind uh, or worse online. And I, there was some conversation about if we prepare the students, can we talk to them? The, the marketing person who's helping us at a very, very low rate said, I've done this a lot in colleges, and we could s tell students, you've got to know what you could be. We're not, we're not expecting. I mean, these aren't provocative statements, but people behave badly online sometimes. Um, that we could prepare students for that. So you can see where I am on this. I just feel uncomfortable that people, children can think that they are prepared, the youngest child participating in it. All parents signed off. They all had to get parent consent for any participation in this. But the youngest one is the seventh grader. Um, but even a 12th grader. I mean, I think you're all mature and wonderful. I do. And you're children to me. You are children to me. I don't care if you're 18, you're still children to me. So I, I just worry about that. Um, so there's, we're having a lot of discussion about does it lose its power if there's if the comments. The social media folks were saying that's how you have it, that's how the dialogue starts. I say let out hogwash. And as far as I'm concerned, social media is powerful and important, but I have yet to see where productive dialogue comes out of social media. So I, obviously my biases are just screamingly obvious. Are you guys clear on where I stand on this? <laughs> so that, that's, I was, uh, I, I told Ms. Camuso that I wanted to talk with the school committee about your thoughts on that in particular. So you said the parents that approved of them being involved in the activity, the yep. students, but was it clear that it involved posting your picture online along with a quote as part of this recognized? Yes, yeah, so they know it's going to Instagram. I don't know if we said, I mean, I, perhaps many parents understand Instagram better than I do, that maybe they understand that comments would be on. If we had the comments on, I would probably say I want yet another permission for that. You know, that has to, let's restate that. Um, I, it, honestly, though, I think, I think you think it's okay, it's going to be okay, until it happens to you or your child. And I'm hoping that nobody says anything negative, but we can't control, it's not just open to students at Hopkins. I mean, Instagram is, 
Um, I wish people behaved well online, and my experience is they don't always. So even when people think I can handle that, maybe I'm worrying too much. I don't. I like the idea. So, I, don't, I guess I don't fully really understand what the quotes entail and the images. So, but assuming they're at least the images alone. So the images are very. So, for example, we have some faculty that are that had their photos taken. If if somebody had the experience of being told, um, what's in it? Things like, uh, you throw like a girl. So that might be the quote underneath it. You throw like a girl. And then that student may have worn their Hawkins jersey because they're an athlete. And another student may have been told, um, well, women can't be that job, you know, whatever it is. And that's, a woman can't be a whatever, fill in the blank, an executive. Um, that picture, that image may be of that student in, you know, a blazer or just their, their Mr. Pitta did a phenomenal job on the images. Mm -hmm. So the images aren't overly, they're not provocative, designed to, you know, sow a divisive discussion. Mm -hmm. and, and the quotes are also just things that, frankly, many people don't even realize that they may say with more frequency than, they, mm -hmm. than they'd like. So the images alone aren't powerful, aren't meaningful with that? No, 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 not without the quotes. And so your thought is you'd go back to the parents and say, just to be assured, these this image and quote would be posted. They know that. What what I'm saying is on Instagram, you can shut off comments. And so the debate is, but if you shut off comments, you shut down the conversation. So whose Instagram account is this going out on? Uh, the student Council has an Instagram account. So it's HA Student Council. Okay. So HA Student Council, who whoever is the owner of that account is the one who would be able to respond on behalf that entity. Mm -hmm. Which is faculty or a student? Uh, it's the advisors and the students, um, I mean I think the students created the account but the advisors have access to the account as well so that okay. the leaders of the group and and so even policing <laughs> it, I mean you can say all right we're going to check it every day but it doesn't take long for a comment to get put up or reposted so that part is that's, that's where I was leaning toward. It's just a, having the images, the Instagram, the hashtag, the campaign, and shutting down the comments. But again, I'm open to um, well, we're really overthinking. Think, I mean, do the advisors want to see comments on this? Because I can see where a dialogue can be very mm -hmm. healthy, and it can actually teach students a lot about mm -hmm. good, the bad, and the ugly <laughs> of the internet. But, yes. Yeah. But I also can see where the advisors are going to be put in a spot where they're going to have to be moderating what's responded. I mean, if everyone has that gut reaction of you get a negative comment logged back at you and you just want to snap off a response real quick, mm -hmm. there's going to have to be some measured response. And as long as the advisors, I, I mean, I don't know what their feelings are on that. So, um, so <laughs> Ms. Camuso was, um, I think she was on the fence. I think she was more originally hadn't even thought about it until I started putting all of my worry in the water about every horrible thing that could happen. Um, so I think she's kind of torn, and I said, well, let me ask the school committee. Let me pump the ball to the school committee, and they can decide what makes sense. I guess my gut tells me that you're right to be concerned, and mm -hmm. it's right to take the steps to assure everybody's aware of the risks. Um, getting back to our strategic vision, a global citizen, this is our life now. And, that, and mm -hmm. I think our kids understand that better than we do. That doesn't mean we stop trying to protect them, mm -hmm. at least to make them aware. But, um, and there is the risk of it going, getting negative quickly and out mm -hmm. of control. Uh, yet that's our reality these days from you know, the top down in this mm -hmm. country. That's how it, it seems to be working. Not to say it's acceptable, mm -hmm. but it is our situation. So I have a couple of points to kind of tie into Heather and Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and Annie, first off, I, I don't know how to use Instagram. Right. I don't have an account. I don't really understand it. And people are like, you need to get on Instagram. You need to get on Twitter. Yeah. I don't understand it. <laughs> so <laughs> don't worry. Um, two thoughts that I have on it. When you're looking at gender equality and you're looking at the troubles that students are facing now and you look at exposing them, like you, you know, kind of touching on what you had said, kind of exposing them to what 
the world is going to bring them, what they're going to face. I, I originally, as the conversation had started, I originally had, had thought, ooh, I don't think that's a good idea to do Instagram. I don't think we should do that because that is going to... But I, I actually think it would be more important to allow others to comment because you might get a lot of powerful comments mm -hmm. and have strong measures in place to provide support and even if you have no negative comments that come back, still provide support and reflect as a group with the students. Okay, well, what did this mean? Mm -hmm. How does this make us feel? How do we, how do we learn to um, take negative feedback or negative comments, process it, and then grow stronger mm -hmm. as an individual and as a group and you know, as a council member, whatever group that they're, they're meeting with, mm -hmm. how do they make themselves stronger because of it and rise above it? So I, I too would be hesitant because certainly if it were my child that had gotten a negative comment on it, you, you get that automatic. And certainly as a kid, um, you know, you're still learning who you are and you're still learning the world. So I would, I would be concerned, but I actually think it's more important to allow them to have that exposure now while they have the supports that they do at the school, while they have the supports <clears throat> of the parents, rather than sheltering too much without, you know, and then sending them off into the world, you know, to figure it out on their own when they don't have this vast support here. So I think it might be a good idea to allow them and have that support for them. But understanding that measures in place that a positive or negative feedback, I think there should be a conversation. Yeah. How did this feel? How did this comment feel? How an interpretation is very, very different amongst mm -hmm. anybody. So you might interpret it as positive and somebody might see it a different way. <coughs> so yeah, that's well said. So that is extremely mm -hmm. helpful. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass that along. And I'm I'm grateful. I, I often say what I'm grateful for about this committee is that you um, you always you speak the truth and and I'm, I'm grateful even when I'm of a different, I'm not of a vastly different mind. I'm actually happy that I'm in the minority here because then I don't have to be the big bummer. No, you can't talk online. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, and you're, you make a good point. I just have to get over this. This is the world and I can't keep children from experiencing negativity online. Although, oh, what I would do to put that genie back in the bottle. <laughs> So I will pass that along, and when April comes at a future meeting, she's asked that the school committee think about um, how, how might we evaluate the impact of this campaign. So we're talking about activities, but at the end of the day, what would be ways in which we would evaluate the impact of the campaign? Which for a researcher, you're thinking, oh, you probably should have thought of that before you started, but, <laughs> but work in progress in the work of social justice. So. so I'm curious how many... You know, the, the, I would be interested in just who's aware of it, who's already invested in it, who's um, from a student perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and not that it's strictly a numbers thing, but is it something that, it sounds like a very smart way to communicate messages. Mm -hmm. um, so how well are those messages disseminating amongst this group? And I think when it's out there, send links in your weekly update to it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's, it's really, what they've done is just. Of course, people that get on Instagram figure it out. <laughs> they, the work they've done is so powerful. This teeny tiny oh, place called Hadley and this teeny tiny school of Hopkins. And it is it's just amazing the work that they've done. Nice. This is an amazing campaign they put together <laughs> all on their own. You can see the exciting things at Hadley Elementary. Uh, so the council, 35 students strong at Hadley Elementary School. And they are coordinating fundraisers and had a food drive. They brought, donated over 460 food items for families in need. And they're looking to create a buddy bench for the ATS playground. So are you familiar with buddy benches? Great. You have a bench. Um, you set up a bench. And a student can go there. And by virtue of sitting there, they're kind of indicating, I could use some help or I could use a friend. Mm -hmm. And anybody would go yes. over and, and help that person out. Oh, and uh, we better work. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm going to put one in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> 
I'll be at it all the time. Dee will say, get off that bench. <laughs> <laughs> um, Monty's March. So I had emailed that it was so wonderful to see our students support Monty's March at Hopkins Academy. The ba pet band played for them. It was wonderful. Pro Merido inductions tonight. I just told you about the gender equity photo shoots. The students are interested in starting a key club here. That's really wonderful. Um, it's a service club that um, is part of the Kiwanis, and uh, our students are really excited about that. And uh, there is, um, they have in place a dating violence discussion group that started at Hopkins. Basketball season starting this week. Our principal search. Um, so just, uh, we are going to, the posting will go up tomorrow. You can see what I provided you was the previous posting for the interim. But I spoke with Northampton superintendent and the Amherst superintendent, and I was looking for um, ways to really underscore our desire to attract uh, diverse candidates who may have um, language skills, or as I write at the bottom, bilingual, bicultural candidates of color and educational leaders from other underrepresented groups are encouraged to apply for this mm -hmm. position. So those are the changes that I'm recommending making. Our search committee is almost all set, except I am wondering, we are one parent short, and I know um, I have been uh, requesting um, some, some participation from parents, and I'm sure people are very busy. Tara, at one point you said you would be interested. Is that still a possibility? Um, yeah, I can still be a, I can be on there as a parent representative if, if you don't have any other, you know, I think we're coming up short there. So otherwise we have, um, we have every, everything taken care of. Um, My only question to you would be, do you have, you, have dates been decided yet? So now, I'll say tentatively, <laughs> you know, depending on dates there yeah. and, and um, the consultant will start communicating directly with the group and just copying me and trying to sort that out. Um, we have, I wanted to bring you up to date on responsive classrooms. So there are several research-based curriculum to uh, promote social and emotional learning at Hadley Elementary School. There's second step, <coughs> steps to respect, something called teaching strategies gold in preschool. But responsive classroom is something that occurs K through, pre-K almost operates like responsive classroom anyways, but K through six. So our teachers have been trained in responsive classroom. And um, we have four teachers that got in-depth training, so they're kind of our resident experts. And one of the reasons I put this under family and community engagement is that a big portion of responsive classroom has to do with partnering with families. This does not replace positive behavioral interventions and supports. It just helps teachers think about how to organize their classroom, like starting with a morning meeting, how to establish kind of group norms with the group, really build a sense of camaraderie and um, teamwork and explicitly uh, teach interpersonal skills. So not just rewarding positive re behavior, but actually creating opportunities in the classroom for people to practice interpersonal skills, develop friendships, and um, get to know one another. Morning meetings a huge part of that. Joint development of classroom rules and classroom norms is another part of it. Uh, this school committee schedule, <coughs> if uh, what I tried to do is look at the kinds of data that you look at through the course of any given year, right? And then try to line that up with the, um, those four, not only the things you see under the strategic objectives, as so instructional leadership, management operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture, but also what you evaluate me on. So this is, if, I put this in the packet, one, so you could see what those things tie to. Also, if there were any data sets that you felt like you know, I'd really like to see these data that would better help me to understand how we're doing in terms of instructional leadership or family and community engagement. And, um, or if there are data that your agenda is organized around certain questions that would better help you think about those questions, just let me know. Um, but I wanted you to have something that you could see annually. Um, the order might change next year, but so every year you can see you know, what, what data you want to be looking at when and why, what it ties to. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. It's funny, I think you and I in the car, when we back from That's what I thought meeting, we were thinking of 
Yeah. I was actually wondering, I saw that when I heard talk to Annie. No, but it was you're <laughs> thinking there's got to be kind of a natural cycle to the academic year mm -hmm. of when you review certain things, when you prepare for budgets, when yep. you review handbooks. Yep, and now, yes. and yeah. you've got that rolling mm -hmm. in here, but you also brought in, I mean, I like that you connected, okay, well, there's data sources right. that we have typically on this study mm -hmm. schedule, and then align it to where, what are our standards or objectives. So that's because we were thinking about, you know, how do you plan ahead for agendas and think about the kind of topics that I think at one of our first meetings we had said, well, let's talk about this at a future meeting. Mm -hmm. We had like five of those things. Mm -hmm. And it was trying to figure out, well, it, as we think about these things, this is kind of a good guide to have as a, mm -hmm. let fit really well with our March presentation on X. Right. You know, that's or right. having somebody come the month before to kind of prepare us for mm -hmm. the next month. Mm -hmm. That's very good idea. And yeah. making sure that we didn't miss anything, and you know, if you tie it into each year, kind of making sure that we don't miss anything important right. from year to year. Yeah. I just I don't see dibbles. Dibbles. Because dibbles has been replaced with fast. Oh. And so I think I gave you fast data, but you're right. I should. NTSS literacy and fast data. Gotcha. So you should see that in August. I know you're sad to see dibbles go. <laughs> Uh, yes, and let me know if there are any other data sets you want to look at. Um, <coughs> the personnel, uh, well, no, I have two. One is the School Committee Response uh, Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School Expansion proposal. That was, yep. Heather had emailed that separately. Yeah. I did. Do you guys have a copy of that? Yeah. Okay. So this really came out of our prior discussions about um, we would need to have a position statement in by December 15th for consideration, the state's consideration of this um, expansion. So Andy had provided us with a couple other districts, how they had handled it. And while this is absolutely short of any data in the charts that was seen in the other letters, I tried to pull, you know, really what we have talked about on the ongoing dialogue, which is we are absolutely supportive of the parents who choose to send their kids to the charter school. We have no problem with that. What we do have a problem with is a raising of a cap on an enrollment that is still not filled and a concern around the demographics of the enrollment that's there. And secondly, the funding formula that we would pretty much, at least statements that we made all along have been because of the funding formula the way that it is, we can't support an increase in the potential number of students that may go to a charter school that would negatively impact our district in terms of the funding, and purely the funding formula. So those are the kind of two things I tried to highlight in the letter. I think it's great. I'm glad you did it. Thank you for taking the lead. I, I support the intent. I just have a few minor edits other than that. Great. I think it looks, I like it that it's short and it's the key points. Okay, there's no crowds or charts. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. okay, he had the school coming back at over 50,000. <laughs> so he's all set. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we can quote devils. <laughs> so if you're supportive of it and want to send me any edits, is it something we can edit? And yeah, so again, I think that, I think we're okay if um, you, yeah, if you, if, how about you do this? How about you send the edits to me? Um, and I, I just want to be careful of uh, open meeting law that you send the edits to me and I will put those together, send them just to you. This seems ridiculous what we have to do, just to you. And once this is sent, the final is sent, yeah. um, these, this letter, because it was email today, the public should know this letter will be available with the school committee handouts in the superintendent's office. So anybody can view that letter or request a copy of it. This letter draft that you're looking at now and then the final letter. So I would say send them to me. I'm just trying to avoid okay. yes. electronic deliberation. Yeah, just send them one by one without everybody else on the email. You know, sorry Tara, I don't know if you want to say anything. No, I, I don't. I feel like they're, I, I feel like Anderson particularly did a really good job at um, really giving a very detailed and thorough 
stands on it, and I think this kind of just simply piggybacks on it, and I think that that's good enough for us. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, FY19 preliminary budget, you'll see more of a conversation just so you have a sense of timeline. Uh, my, the all boards meeting didn't happen <coughs> last night. Um, so we will, in December, you'll pretty much have, here's what it looks like if every, as people have requested it. Here's what, here's what teachers are requesting so today. Chris sends out budget documents to all the cost center controllers, which are the principal and the director of special education. Um, and then they'll send them out to their department chairs or ask for feedback from the teachers. The first thing you'll see in December is, here's, here are our projections right now. Here's what people ask for. This is what it would look like. We will have unit C and unit A data that we can plug right in, so we'll know what salaries in those two units are going to cost us. Um, but that's the very first pass. The town does expect something as early as January. So that usually that first pass, unless you direct us to take something out right away, is what goes to that first conversation in January. But January is a long way from where we finally end up. Um, we'll talk about it again January, February, and I will aim to have the official school committee vote in March. It has to be voted on before town meeting, otherwise you have no budget to go to town meeting floor. And I'm always fearful if we didn't get a quorum in April, you technically could not have it. You have to have it voted by you all before it goes to town meeting. What's the guidance to those cost controllers? Flat? <laughs> there is, at this point, it's tell us that teachers are expected to give feedback or anybody who's asked to give feedback. Uh, what are you requesting? And if it's a change, if it's, if it's an increase or any change, what, what has changed and why? And um, at this point, we don't, we don't give parameters. We say, what, what are you asking for and why? And then we start looking through where you can make adjustments. I've also invited the Special Education Parent Advisory Council to, I believe that they're meeting in this, their January meeting. I believe that they're going to, I mean, they, they should, just as they, um, when Tara, before Tara was on the school committee, came in with CPAC and presented to the school committee because they actually have a role that's defined in regulation about um, advising the school committee on matters of budget and policy. And so I've invited them to talk amongst themselves about um, what they would like the school committee to consider in the FY19 budget, they'll have that conversation in January, and then I believe one or two representatives, or as many as want to come, but I believe somebody will be at your January meeting, also giving some feedback from CPAC. How are we handling the extra classroom in next year's budget? Are we keeping that? So remember, you have three in grade six now. Yeah. So what should happen is that um, it wouldn't be, it was posted as a one-year position because you'll have a, a senior teacher who would bump because right. your, your sixth graders are graduating and there's not another class that's large enough for three teachers. Um, but that group of students will still have three classrooms. Right. Right. Okay. So you'll have an extra teacher in seventh grade then? No. no, so what happens is, is that, that when we hired, we made it clear that right. this was most likely a one-year position only right. that, that the individual would have knowledge of that, right. but that whipping was... And how can this can absorb with the faculty they have? That yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Hopkins right. class sizes are always very small. Yeah. So that's where I stand with budget. Personnel, not a whole lot happening. Um, how about that? In your packet, so yeah. <laughs> it's not a lot. We did charter, um, and um, so your school committee reports. Uh, public comment. Let us know. School committee report negotiations. We're done with two units. Yeah. So in executive session, you will vote, and after you vote executive session, you take a roll call vote in executive session. We do have to return to open session. Um, I have said to John that he does not need to remain for that because all you have to do by law is walk into open session and say, here are the, here is our roll call vote. <coughs> Finance tri-board. 
Um, Tara and I went to the tribe meeting maybe two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, you know, they really requested that we remain engaged in the process um, with the other, the finance committee and the select board. Um, they asked as part of that to appoint really a school committee liaison um, to the select board chair, Molly, um, which seems an appropriate role for me to play. Mm -hmm. um, and then they asked there to have some work groups, they have four work groups, two of which makes uh, sense to appoint have a single representative from the school committee serve alongside the other representatives. So the two committees they need are HR, Human Resources, and Technology, um, the IT systems. So if you're interested in either of those individually, just send me an email. And I'll, I'll send something to Vera mm -hmm. and to Keith so that they're aware. Um, so those groups will be working out in December to really finalize um, the approach, uh, some potential solutions for the town budget mm -hmm. in handling those uh, departments. Do you have any clarity on what's entailed in each of those technology HR? How was the time commitment? I don't know what the time commitment is. I mean, I know that the idea is to wrap this up this year, yeah. but I think that the, the idea is to promote thinking about um, the sharing of resources. And, and you know, we may have some great ideas in terms of being the largest HR <laughs> employer in the town, um, but also our own technology um, and initiatives that we've undertaken over the last couple of years, more than that. So mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how often they're gonna meet. I think each of those groups is gonna be up to them, how they meet. It's, um, I don't even know if they're considered open, like having to be posted. I just don't know the details of that. And I think that, um, yeah, it sounds like it's going to be fairly fast-paced and quick to try to get those done. Yeah. And then I know that Molly had asked that I think you would to forward that along as soon as we made those decisions if we could have somebody on the group so that we could be included because I'm not sure if they've even started that discussion in those groups already. Yeah, so, you, so let me know as soon as you can um, and I'll reach out to Keith and Mara um, too to see if either of them are interested. Fields we talked about yeah. <coughs> prior to theirs to start working on fundraising too. Mm -hmm. Contracting. CES, I see there's something here from whomever. She's not here, but I did include the um, executive director's report from CES for you to review, and that's just what's going on at CES. Do we need to go over these action items? Let's make sure. Um, Yes, so we do, because we haven't done minutes or warrants. Um, so, I'm sorry, one of these, instead of saying AP, um, yes, I'm sorry, it should say AP. So we're going to try this, and if it doesn't take, then um, you'll be voting the exact same things again in December. Um, because on the approval of AP warrants submitted in November 2017, um, Tara and Paul, between the two of you, you have to first and second. Heather has to abstain. Why is we that? then take a vote. I'm, I'm going to be abstaining from either both approving AP warrants and voting on it because I work for Pearson, which is a vendor that is paid by your district, and so I don't want there to be any kind of conflict of interest. What is an AP one? Accounts payable. Any yeah, bill. The yeah. vendors. Oh, so you don't approve those? I don't anymore. Oh, I don't. No. So uh, I'll approve payroll. That's yeah, fine. right. Um, I have access to the vendor ones. I can look at them, but um, I just I wanted to just separate out any potential, you know, conflict. Um, I'll also I have a signed or will have sign on file signed, you know, just acknowledgement that. Disclosure, I think, is what they're yeah. called. Yeah. 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 So yeah. do you need another person, though? So what I think we can, I think that when there's an abstention, <coughs> it's a quorum, uh, it's the majority of those present, I think. So I'm kind of falling down on my Robert's rules. That's why I say, if I'm wrong on this, when I call for it tomorrow, you'll be voting the exact same things in December, because I'll say the vote didn't carry. But what I believe is that if there's a motion in a second on the AP, which already signed by school committee, 
um, even with a two zero zero in favor, a two uh, one zero, mm -hmm. that um, you can move. Obviously, the minutes are fine. What Heather is allowed to do is once the AP votes have been voted separately, then she can vote total warrant because that includes payroll. Right. And then, again, if it doesn't take that far, call for tomorrow, then he <laughs> says, what, what we do. So I make a motion, a motion to approve AP warrant submitted in November 2017. I second it. And, and we, all in favor? Aye. Your abstention? I abstain. Okay. Do the same for the next. This the other one's Heather can vote on yeah. everything else. So approval. I have a motion to approve October twenty third, twenty seventeen minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion to approve warrant submitted November twenty seventeen. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then should we just keep going? Uh, we can't. We're going to come back on the approval of after you've actually right. approved it in executive session. Um, so now we need to read the executive session then? We, uh, we well, did the letter and we're all set with the yeah. letter and the school choice ones. I don't think we need to do a motion on the letter. Or do you, do you want to take a motion on the approval of the letter uh, with edits or is it, this is coming from me? It's more? probably safe to just take a motion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a uh, motion to approve uh, the letter to, regarding Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion School uh, Charter School expansion. Uh, with edits. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Do um, we need to do the, the funds for the athletic No, so I'm just putting you, you don't have to vote this now, but again, I'm reminding you, <coughs> since we haven't heard from Berkshire Design, we don't know how much they're going to cost. We, we will take them out of operating now. We can't touch school choice without your approval. We will take them out of operating now, add to that $487,000 deficit. Now we'll, we'll expense it against operating, and then know that if for some reason we had to, because we didn't budget for this, that we would be looking for a school cho uh, vote to take it from school choice after. Um, okay, so executive session. So. Can I just ask before we bring mm -hmm. it for a sex session? I know we'll come back, but the next meeting date, Oh, uh, we don't because the last Monday is Christmas. So right. um, I will email um, availability for a quorum. Try to get. Okay. Yeah, I'll make sure I do that tomorrow. Who needs to read what? So the chair will. <laughs> uh, somebody. Yeah. So anybody can just read the motion language. Um, you yeah. want to read the motion language? Is that what you said? Yeah. Move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and contract negotiations with non-union personnel. I have determined an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and to reconvene an open session. We need to make a motion as such. And so we need to re make a roll call vote. You need a second and a roll call. I'll second that. Uh, Keith and Humer are not here. Tara? Yes. I support Heather? Yes. Okay. So we're now in executive session. Um, So back from executive session, I want to report up at the Unit A 2018 and 2021 uh, collective bargaining agreement <coughs> was unanimously approved. Heather Klesch voted yes, Tara Brugger voted yes, Paul Pfeiffer voted yes. Uh, also that Unit C 2018 and 2021 collective bargaining agreement was unanimously supported. Heather Klesch voted yes, Tara Brugger voted yes, and Paul Pfeiffer voted yes. That's it. All right, we will adjourn, and the next meeting date is to be determined, correct? Yeah. Probably That's sometime the week before Christmas? Yes, I'll send you an email, and I think you need a motion to adjourn. I can't remember. I make a motion to adjourn. I second. All in favor? Okay. Right. I don't think that time is right for me. You don't think? It's off. That's I don't know that right. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, that's quite true. Very good. Uh, also, that needed CE 2018 and 2021 the collective bargaining agreement was unanimously supported. Other Bush voted yes. Terror Ruger voted yes. That's all quite true. That's it. All right, we will adjourn and the next meeting date is to be determined, correct? Yeah. Probably since then the week before Christmas? Yes, yes. I'll send you an email and I think you need a motion to adjourn. I can't remember. I make a motion to adjourn. I second. All in favor? Okay. I don't think my time is right, honey. You don't think? It's off. That's something to do that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> reading that. So you look at the clock and I thought that's not right. <laughs>